Today, I'd like to tell you about one other small business person. This person, I went to buy his business from him and he turned me down, which was very wise. But this was a fellow who was born about eight years before I was. He was born in 1922. He was a, we'll call him Jack, lived in the Midwest. He was a pretty good athlete, didn't like school much. And this fellow, who was destined for this but did not know it, Jack, went to college for a year and then dropped out. He really wasn't that interested in school. And the year he dropped out was 1941. And when the country became, the United States became under attack, he went down to the uh, Army Air Force recruiting station, volunteered, and they turned him down because he had hay fever. So he went over to the Navy and uh, again volunteered and they took him. They put him on an aircraft carrier. Uh, he, he flew uh, small fighter planes during World War II, got two distinguished flying crosses from the, uh, from the uh, Navy. Uh, and then he came back to the Midwest. So now we've got a young guy, probably by this time he would be 23 or 24 years old. And the interesting thing is, he got back to the Midwest and he actually kind of went from one job to another for a short period of, or not such a short period of time. And he finally became a used car salesman at, the, uh, at a Cadillac dealership uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. And at age 35, having moved up in the organization, the sales organization, he said to his uh, boss, uh, could I go into car leasing business with you? The boss said, well, if you'll cut your salary in half and you'll come up with, it was $25,000, which he borrowed, uh, we can become partners in a car leasing company. So uh, my friend Jack uh, started at age 35 in the car leasing business. And he had seven cars. Uh, it was pretty slow. In fact, one of the things he did was whenever the phone rang, he let it ring three or four times so people would think that he was very busy answering other phones. And of course, it was the only call he was gonna get all day. So his first venture was okay, but it wasn't really going to go anyplace. And there's a lesson in this for all of us. At age 40, he decided with 17 vehicles, 17 cars, he was going to go into competition in the rent, in the rent -a car uh, business. So now he's taking on Hertz and Avis and National and people like that who have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cars. And he's got 17 cars and his cars aren't any different than theirs. I mean, he's buying them from General Motors or Ford or Chrysler. And uh, he can't get the airport locations. Those companies have them all sold up. But he was determined that he would basically offer the customer, can't offer him a different car, uh, but he can offer him friendlier service than they've ever seen. And so he started a company. He named it after the battleship that he'd flown from in the Pacific, which was the USS Enterprise. And uh, he died about a year, year and a half ago. But when he died, his rent-a-car company, starting with those 17 cars, was worth more than Hertz and Avis and all the rest of the rental cars put together. The man's name was Jack Taylor, and his son, Andy Taylor, is a good friend of mine, uh, runs the business now. A grandchild is in the business. They'll probably be a fourth generation along the line. So this, this man in the United States, he didn't invent artificial intelligence. Any one of us could have entered those businesses, but he lived by the, 
by the creed basically of, of delighting his customers and working with people and establishing the relationship with them so that they in turn would want to delight the customers. He, he couldn't go out there and take care of every rental car uh, possibility, but he, he learned how to project himself uh, and his attitude toward his fellow man and his desire you know, to make a friend out of every customer. He managed to take very ordinary cars and turn them into this extraordinary uh, business from virtually nothing. And, uh, and it illustrates several points. Uh, one is you don't necessarily get it right the first, exactly right the first time. I mean, the car leasing business, you know, basically you were competing on the cost of money to finance cars. And, and it's very hard to delight a customer when you just give them the car and tell them to send you a monthly check for five years and you'll be back at that time. So his talents were being wasted basically in that business. But at the age of 40, with all of that experience behind him, he found, he, he, he found the golden key and he, he took a very ordinary business and turned it into an absolutely extraordinary uh, operation. And the, he didn't worry about whether the Federal Reserve was going to tighten or ease. He didn't worry about whether the stock market was up or down yesterday. No, he, didn't, he didn't worry about the things he couldn't change, but he did worry, he did focus on the one thing he could change, and that was the customer's experience. And I have seen uh, the one I didn't, the one that got away, Enterprise, I went down to Florida and tried to talk him into selling to Berkshire, and he was smart enough not to do it. Probably the value of the company has quadrupled since I made that visit. Uh, but he, he was smart enough to see that he would find that business. Henry Ford, as you may know, failed twice before he started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. I mean, the, the test isn't whether you get the greatest business idea in the world the first time out. The test is whether you keep learning as you go along what your strengths are and what you can do for your customers, what you can bring especially to the party. You need a genuine, a genuine desire day in, day out to delight the customer. I've never, I've never seen a business, and I've seen a lot of businesses, but I've never seen one that delights the customer that, that doesn't succeed. I mean, what you want is that customer the next day when they think, do I want to rent a car or do I want to buy some furniture? What goes through their mind? You know, it's the place where they've had a great experience. Um, I don't know what I paid for this type. Actually, probably if somebody gave it to me, but for the purposes of this speech, I will <laughs> say, I, I have no idea, but what I, or the shirt I'm wearing, or this, but I do know, I will remember how I was treated when I bought it. I mean, you, you long forget about the price, but you never forget whether you had a good experience or a poor experience uh, with the purchase experience.